I'm Jason Greenberg, and Jean Montanez and I are both on the Community Advisory Committee representing Robbinsdale. And so we wanted to create a forum because there's been a lot of information that's been going out. There's obviously been announcements that have been coming up and um, details around how the line has changed and what's been going on. Um, but we wanted to make sure it was a little more focused on Robbinsdale um, since that's the community that we represent and that's where we both live. Uh, so to not only learn things that are going on on the line in general specific and then also specific to Robbinsdale, but also giving our community the opportunity to um, give their feedback and ask questions too. So with that, I will introduce the uh, the project team. Sophia, I guess I'll let you kind of take it from there and, and, and do that part. Sure, thanks Jason. And uh, thank you so much both to Jean and yourself for helping us organize this and uh, putting some focus on Robbinsdale. Um, we really appreciate your service on the Community Advisory Committee and all your efforts uh, for this tonight. So. From the project team supporting these efforts, I'm Sophia Guinness. I'm our manager of public involvement for transit system development. And if you have questions about the project, I'm usually the email that you look up. And uh, with me, I have uh, three of my colleagues who will kind of go around the horn and introduce themselves as well. Um, so Sam, Dan, uh, to you. Sure, thanks Sophia. Good evening, everybody. Happy to be with you. I'm Sam O'Connell and I'm serving as the council's project lead. So working with Sophia and um, our team. Um, so just happy to be with you. Happy to hear your thoughts tonight about how Robbinsdale is thinking about the project and any questions that you might have. Um, ha that's what we're here for to answer them and um, looking for a good discussion. So uh, thank you. And I'm gonna hand this over to my colleague, uh, Nick Landwehr. Hey, good evening, everybody. I have to unmute. Um, uh, great to be here. I'm looking forward to a discussion uh, on, on the project. And uh, I'm Nick Landwer. I am with Metro Transit and I'm Metro Transit's engineering and design lead for the project. Been with the project for since 2015. So turn over to you today, Dan. Yeah, thanks, everybody. And, you know, thanks, Jason and Jean, for, for putting this together. Um, it really is. It really is a is a big deal. I think in our in our minds when we have the cooperation of um, members that have taken like Jason and Gene to the quarter or to the community advisory committee and taken um, taken the initiative to help kind of represent their community. They're represented. We have we have a business advisory committee and a community advisory committee um, that are part of our project and. So each of the municipalities have have uh, identified and appointed various members to those committees, and so Jason and Gene have taken uh, taken the initiative to kind of pull together a Robbinsdale listening session, and so that's great, and we're happy we're happy to be here tonight. Um, so I, my name is Dan Solar, and I am a um, Hennepin County Public Works staff person who has been working with a lot of this team, Nick, Sophia, and Sam, since at least the beginning of 2015 um, on the Blue Line Extension LRT project. And so while the Blue Line Extension LRT project is not new to the city of Robbinsdale, the changes that we are proposing to the project are new to the city and different and will affect the city in different ways. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. I also just want to acknowledge that also on the call today um, and also here listening in is Anna Schmiel. Anna um, represents um, Anna represents Hennepin County Commissioner um, Jeff Lundy's office. And so she's here in District 1's um, County Commissioner office to listen for feedback as well. So we're glad to have Anna here also. So really what we want to talk about is what's different? What, what's different now having worked on the Blue Line Extension since 2015? Wait a minute, guys, shouldn't this project be open by now? Um, shouldn't we already be riding trains if we've been working on this for five, 
plus years. And um, I would love to say that we're talking about being in construction, but of course we are not. And in fact, we are, um, we are a ways from getting into construction. We are transitioning and making a transition on this project. As many of you may know, and even if you even if you are not familiar with this project and this is your first time, there was for many years an attempt by Met Council and the Hennepin County to and, and all the local communities, Minneapolis, Golden Valley, Robbinsdale, Crystal, and Brooklyn Park, to advance the extension of the Blue Line light rail from Target Field through those five communities on an alignment that went down Highway 55, leaving downtown Minneapolis to the BNSF Railroad corridor, followed about eight miles of co-located um, alignment with Burlington Northern from Highway 55 to north of 694 up in Brooklyn Park, transitioned over to West Broadway, and then went on West Broadway um, to the north of Highway 610. And through developing engineering, through developing environmental documentation, public engagement, thousands of meetings, um, we have been unsuccessful jointly as Met Council and Hennepin County with all of the help of our project partners to move forward with an agreed upon um, arrangement with Burlington Northern to co-locate within the railroad corridor. And so as you see this map on the screen, for those of you that can see this map, the yellow that's highlighted here shows the extent of the light rail corridor that was to be co-located with Burlington Northern. We have made numerous attempts over the years to negotiate a joint co-located arrangement with them. We've worked with Burlington Northern on and off, both politically and from an engineering standpoint and through lobbying efforts and all kinds of, of negotiations to try to get there. And we have not been successful. Ultimately, Burlington Northern, unlike most property owners, controls their right of way. They are not subject to eminent domain and condemnation, and we need an agreement with them. We even so far as went to attempt to purchase the entire what we call Monticello subdivision, which is you know kind of a long cul-de-sac of BNSF tracks that runs from downtown Minneapolis out to Monticello, of which this segment is part of it. And we've been unsuccessful to do that either. So knowing that we were not able to advance this project and knowing that a long-term in place transit improvement for this segment of Hennepin County is very critical from both the transportation, economic development and community building um, standpoint, we've attempted to now transition this blue line extension project from the former alignment to try to reach a new community supported alignment to build LRT on that doesn't use Burlington Northern right away. I think you can move this, Sophia. So we set some project goals simply to attain by the end of 2021, and they're very simple, to evaluate route options and determine if there is a community supported LRT route that goes from Target Field Station in downtown Minneapolis, northwest through this kind of corridor area up to Northern Brooklyn Park um, at the previous end of the line up north of 610 to evaluate some options, to look at benefits and impacts. What are the pros? What are the cons? To begin to advance conceptual engineering, to see and reach uh, um, can we develop and adopt a community supported alignment that we can then advance through the process? That's our goal. That's what we're working on to the end of this year. If we're successful and we do at the end of 21 adopt that community supported route, then we'll continue with conceptual engineering. We'll evaluate project benefits. We'll identify that route and we'll determine what are our steps forward for completing our environmental work. So just as a quick aside, the previous alignment that you saw went through a very robust 
um, environmental process and an environmental impact statement that identified the impacts of the project, identified mitigation measures, and started to put those in place, we will have to look at similar environmental documentation for the new parts of the alignment. Not everything will be new. There's some areas up on the north end that would likely stay the same where we're up along West Broadway, but we will have to do that work. And in 21, in, in 2022, um, begin that environmental analysis, reach municipal consent on what the project is fully with all of the municipalities along the route, and then continue to develop construction plans and design details for this project. So we don't get to beyond 2021 until we get to where we are in, or in, in at a community supported alignment. So tier one, we're, we, we've completed maybe back about a month ago. We released options for routes to be analyzed and discussed in this initial screening as we move forward into evaluation. Nick's gonna talk about what that means for Robbinsdale um, because in Robbinsdale, we did not like come up with four different spots that we could put LRT. Um, we, we've come up with a recommendation for where LRT will go and now we're really firmly in that tour, tier two world of evaluating um, how it will fit, where it will fit, how it will op, how an LRT route will operate, at least preliminarily, and see then if we can't advance that um, as a recommended route by the end of this year. So that's a real high overview of, of what we're doing here. We're essentially saying we had an LRT project, a lot of it was on BNSF right away. If we can't move forward with BNSF right away, can we come up with a route that doesn't use railroad right away? but still serves and solves and identifies the same benefits and, um, and improvements that this project was to do, which was to build a light rail extension of the blue line through these communities. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to Nick. Nick's gonna talk a little bit about, you know, what we've done with initial route identification and how we wanna move forward. Uh, thanks, Dan. So um, the initial route identification uh, is the map that, that, that we're showing on the screen right now that goes from Target Field Station all the way north up into Brooklyn Park uh, near the Target campus at Oak Grove Station. So we, as, as the staff came up with our recommended routes to, to, to bring out to the public, to, to evaluate, get comments on, have discussions on, uh, uh, this is this is how we broke it down into three different set areas. Uh, so we broke it down in area one, which is uh, uh, mostly primarily in Brooklyn Park. This is an area that really wasn't affected by the uh, railroad uh, lack of being able to work within the railroad. We had the design that goes up the center of, of West Broadway from basically 73rd all the way up to Oak Grove, just north of uh, 610. So. Uh, we have four stations that are located in that area, Oak Grove Station, 93rd, 85th, and Brooklyn Park Station. Again, we're at 90% design on theirs, on those. There's no, there was no reason to really uh, move beyond uh, what we've already had in place from, from the, the previous uh, project. Um, where we are at in, in, in Robbinsdale and Crystal is, is that area too, where we're, we're taking a look at you know how how we have a route option basically it's it's county road 81 but uh, we can discuss that a little bit more in the next uh slide and then area three is down in in, in minneapolis uh where we have two route recommendations uh as we looked at you know how do we get uh from you know up to county road 81 and from uh target field station really uh, what what came clear was obvious and our staff recommendations to look at were Lowry Avenue, which is kind of Washington Avenue through Lowry, and then uh, West Broadway Avenue. And then uh, we have a bunch of different uh, options or you know suggested links to evaluate um, to either get to West Broadway or, or Lowry Avenue. But uh, uh, our, our primary goal giving going through this is uh, um, uh, on, on this map is is to confirm the route options up in area one and two. So again, area one is is basically what we we looked at before. Area two will jump into that map next, and then uh, area area, th area three again. What we'll, we'll do a lot of work with Minneapolis and and those communities there to 
to to to have the discussions and and have that community supported route. So all these options that we're, we're we're rolling out are based on our project principles, and the project principles are really to you know to to uh, stay true to our our, our our project that we had before. You know, continue to serve the communities that were were served by this before, and um, we want to. Um, We'll do a conceptual review of the LRT right away in operational needs, and and also uh, we want it applicable to the previous work. Again, area one up on the north in Brooklyn Park uh, that that is at ninety percent design. Uh, area two is is very close to the to the rail corridor, and then uh, and area three will will get that connection through Minneapolis. So um, we are looking for community key feedback on these key destinations. We are looking for that discussion. These are not done deals. Uh, these are really lines on a map right now to, to really start the discussion. So the slide we have up now is area two, um, basically going from 73rd Avenue up in Brooklyn Park and, and, and down to uh, where Lowry Avenue and West Broadway uh, connect or, or, or come together down um, by North Memorial Hospital. So on the map here, the, the, that hatched yellow line that you see, it was the previous route that followed along the rail corridor. And uh, in that route, there's some shadowed in spots here that indicate the stations that have been identified with that route. So we had, we had a station at 63rd, uh, we had a station at Bass Lake Road, and we had a station uh, by the Hubbard Transit Center um, at 42nd in Robbinsdale. Um, so as we go down this corridor and we and, and why why did we just why are we just presenting county road 81 i guess is a question and really there is not a lot of options that are, are through that can that, that stay true to those to our project um previously um and and serve the same areas and we have geographical barriers too with with crystal lake and twin lakes and, and the crystal airport too that that really make it hard to find alternate routes that that go through this area so 81 is really the apparent route that, that that comes out of it. So as we're looking at it and we're coming down from the north at 63rd, uh, County Road 81 is directly adjacent to the railroad right away that we were in. So we, we feel that uh, 63rd station, there's there's 63rd Avenue, there's an existing park and ride in that area. And that would be, you know, we continue to evaluate a station in this area, just really makes sense. Same thing at Bass Lake Road. Um, Bass Lake Road is really a a key connector for uh, the business district in Crystal, and and it really makes sense to to maintain that that station commitment there. So we are still close to the railroad in this location, and we'll continue to look at at a station in this location. As we start to move down into Robbinsdale, though, you see the map that that black line starts to diverge from the railroad corridor uh, to the east as we go into Robbinsdale. So this gives us a you know. A, Pushing us a little bit farther away from where we were, but it maybe gives us some opportunities to val to evaluate as we're going down. So, um, we'll we'll look at uh, as we get into Robbinsdale. Uh, we we had that station at 42nd, and we want to keep something that that evaluate a station that that serves that downtown area. So we'll look at we've looking at stations that would be between maybe 40 40th 40th and 42nd Street which is kind of that main business area. It makes sense to, to have something there and, and evaluate and look at. And then, you know, this is an opportunity that we'd heard in the previous project a lot was, you know, why don't you run to, to North Memorial? How can you get the train to North Memorial? Uh, it really makes sense to serve North Memorial. Well, this alignment gives us that opportunity to have North Memorial as a destination on the map. So, you know, potentially have North Memorial campus as a station to, to serve in this little, little care area. So as we're going through the, the, the this route option through Robbinsdale, you know, we're doing some preliminary analysis. Uh, we're, we're, we're running lines through the map to see, you know, to, to really see if there's fatal flaws in, 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 the, in this option and, and discuss what the challenges and issues are going forward. So as we're looking at it, we want to make sure that we maintain all our traffic signals and crossings uh, in, 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 in place as we're going through there. Um, we, we're looking in specifically in, in the Robbinsdale area uh, to maintain that four lane road design that goes through Robbinsdale. Uh, um, again, looking at two station, potentially two stations within Robbinsdale uh, and, and really get, get that discussion where we think it, it fit in best with, with 
existing businesses with proposed development and 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 really what public input in downtown area and uh, for the North Memorial campus. You know, is it closer to the hospital or is it maybe down towards the uh, the, the clinics uh, towards the bottom of the hill? Um, we want to make sure as we're, we're taking a look at this, the big concern is safety and access. And and as we look at it, we'll want to make sure that our designs are all focused on pedestrians, the pedestrian experience, the safety that it's comfortable to get uh, to the stations or you know if, if we are in county road 81 you know to, to not only get to the station but get across the road also um so that is basically um the the presentation you know for our route uh, recommendations our staff recommended routes so so while we're still developing designs we're we're going to bring you some kind of real world examples around the our our twin cities to kind of show how some of these design assumptions that we're thinking about, Rob, and still kind of kind of play out, uh, and then talk about some of the feedback um, that we're seeking as well. So, uh, just to just to give a little bit of an overview, you know, when we talk about safety and the experience of our of our of our stations, you know, we're really wanting to add to the value of a residential or business district, and um, you know, our stations have security cameras; they're well lit. Um, we we hope that they are vibrant places that add an element to a community that is beneficial. We hear a lot about you know people walking and biking and those mode changes. So as Nick talked about, you know our design really thinks about how people are transitioning between those between those two, how uh, it you you'd experience it. Um, you know the. We assume people are walking and biking to our stations and interacting with traffic along the way. And you know, we kind of get you kind of hear get, get questions sometimes of like, well, I hear LRT hit this car or something like that. You know, when you uh, we have a lot of safety features in place in our system and work really closely with the community to put that in place. Uh, and and usually, if something goes wrong, if you hear about it on the news, it's because it happens so infrequently that when it does, it is news. Uh, and it, it is it is often you know somebody not paying attention to to our to our safety features in our system. The the benefit of LRT too is you know we're 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 moving no matter the weather right it, it's 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 about our regional connectivity and getting uh, to where you need to be. So when you think of a, a downtown Robbinsdale and what a four lane roadway would look like uh, in a in a residential or business district. Um, you know, there's places along our existing system that can can lend an eye to to it, and and as well as with national examples. So, uh, in the picture here, we have a you know four lane roadway with you know businesses that are just right there, and people are walking and traveling to to our stations, existing in the same spaces. Uh, one of the things that we often also get asked about is just kind of how, what are what are our operations like, and as an extension of the blue line. The, this is a line that would get you all the way to Bloomington and the airport uh, and a one seat ride. So when you think of our regional connectivity and and whatnot, um, I live close to Robbinsdale, you know, kind of getting on the train, going to a, 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 the business district or getting somewhere uh, further in our metro area. Uh, kind of our kind of that 10 minute frequency. Now there's times of the day that that's not the case. But it's it's light rail. One of the benefits is you don't need a schedule. You just hop on. Uh, it's part of it. And then fares that are similar to our 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 bus network. So kind of a little bit of what to expect from us and how to give feedback. We'll have plenty of discussion tonight, uh, but just want to highlight it for folks. So as Nick talked about, we have a lot of work to do in terms of, of showing that engineering, kind of those design assumptions and principles that were put together, you know, putting that on paper, we're still collecting feedback on uh, desired station locations, but we have been hearing from, from Rosman Sale residents about the desire to serve downtown and the desire to serve North, North Memorial Hospital. So that has been, that's something that we've been confirming in our community engagement. And we wanna come back to all of you to show more about what LRT could like look like exactly in Robbinsdale and how that fits within the existing world. So that's all coming forward in the year. We'll also evaluate the project itself. So there's a goals that we're currently asking about in our survey, and that'll turn into objectives and criteria. So when we think about 
you know, getting getting that community supported alignment together, really just kind of showcasing those benefits and those impacts. We're also working on other pieces, kind of not losing that past project and some of the things that people were hoping for from that, as well as uh, addressing uh, displacement uh, and having that as part of our conversation. So obviously feedback tonight, I will have our contact information of where to reach us, but just also wanna let you know of a few tools available to your community members, which is we have an interactive map uh, you can go in and leave comments about station areas or just even issues and opportunities that you see in Robbinsdale that you would like us to address, kind of like specific locations. We have a survey that's out. I'm sure many of you have taken it and I encourage your neighbors to do so. And uh, I am available. This is my email. If you have specific questions or concerns or want to meet, uh, this is where you find me and we can definitely come to future events. So with that, I will uh, stop sharing the screen um, I can pull it back up if we need, but it, uh, we'll have some time for discussion. Thanks, Sophie. Okay, maybe, so, oh, Dan, so go maybe ahead. Before we, maybe before we start some questions, I just want to, you know, make sure people understand what we do and don't have tonight, right? So this is our first, this is, this is, it's not the first listening session town hall that we've had, but but it's the first one specifically tailored to Robbinsdale. And so we're here to talk about, you know, the pros, the cons, the issues associated with um, LRT and primarily LRT along Highway 81. What we don't have available is we don't have a layout, right? We're not, we're not at the level yet where we're, where we're ready to get, I don't know how we'll gather in the future, but where we used to gather in the Robbinsdale Middle School gym or in the community center where we're laying out maps with different alternatives and looking at actual direct property impacts. We're still at a high level. We want to get some feedback as we start to develop what those may look like, get some, get some concerns, thoughts, issues from people. This will not be by far the only gathering that we have and we'll work on other ways that we can engage in those drawings as we move forward. So all the kind of questions I'm seeing in the chat so far are all really good. That's the kind of level that we're at right now. And that's what we want to continue to engage on. Great. That's a perfect way to set the table. So there have been some questions in the chat uh, and I'll make sure I present those to the group. We'll listen to those. If you do want to ask a question and, and just talk or have a discussion, uh, you can raise your hand by hovering over your name in the list uh, and it'll give you the option to uh, to raise your hand and I'll just be, um, Sophia and I will be paying attention for raised hands. Um, but I think one, one of the first questions that got asked and I think it's a really good one to set the table here is just around um, what exactly community support means. So we talk about like a community supported alignment and I think it would be helpful to have a definition of what does that mean, community support. Sam, you want to take this, or you want me to? You want me to start? Maybe I'll start. Um, and Sam may, and and Sophia or Nick may add as well. Um, so when we work on big projects like this, we work on the. We anticipate various levels of of funding support, and this project would would be funded with. Um, county dollars for sure, probably, um, and hopefully some federal dollars from, from uh, the federal transit program. And so we want to be able to advance projects that are not fraught with controversy and, um, and objectionable to a lot of folks. Now, ultimately, the decision makers on whether to move this project forward will be um, both the Met Council and the Hennepin County Board. As funders and project sponsors, ultimately they'll be the decision makers. But, but there is a recommendation, there's an a, a advisory body made up of elected officials from, from uh, various entities, including the city of Robbinsdale called the Quarter Management Committee. And Robbinsdale has representation on that, as well as all of the other cities, county, Met Council, Minneapolis Park Board, Metropolitan Airports Commission, 
various entities that are adjacent to and and close to the project. And they also, that committee will make recommendations to the council, Met Council and Hennepin County Board about advancement of the project. And the Community Advisory Committee and Business Advisory Committee will also make recommendations to that body um, about moving this forward. There will be times when the city councils will plug in via municipal consent to take an action about agreeing to move the project forward as well. I can tell you that the policymakers at the county are very interested in moving, and, and at the Met Council, are very interested in moving this project forward, but they want to do it with the, um, with the support of the adjacent communities. And so to that end, that's what we will seek um, from all of the communities along this route, including Robbinsdale. That's what leads us to a community supported alignment. And, and Dan, uh, if I can add to that, I think as um, community members think about the light rail, you know, it's also forward thinking, right? It's really identifying um, a service and a route that is going to serve the community not only today, but in the future. And um, and sometimes that means, you know, there's definitely some pros and cons. None of the LRT projects that we've ever done haven't been controversial at some level, at some point that is fair, that is absolutely what happens. Um, it's no secret that, we, you know, some of these projects are also sued um, because they are very complicated. They, they definitely have impacts, positive and in some cases, maybe negative impacts to some communities. So what we're hoping to achieve out of this, as Dan's kind of talked about the process, is that the community does come together and we begin to identify the best alignment and the best service for the project moving forward and gives us the best success that not only for our region, but for the state, these are projects that compete nationally um, for the federal dollars, like Dan had mentioned. So it also provides us with an opportunity to really put the best project forward that will allow us to compete with the Denvers and the Dallases and the um, Seattles of the world as well as they look for also trying to tap into federal funding to make these projects, um, uh, to realize these, uh, these projects as well. So hopefully that provides an answer to that question. Otherwise, I think we can, um, we can share a little bit more about that too in, in the discussion. Great. Thanks for that. Um, so the next question I, I am hoping is is a, a more straightforward answer. Just someone was curious about, you know, thinking of the old corridor and, and the BNSF section. Um, it said the, the question is around just explaining why railroads like BNSF aren't subject to eminent domain. Like, why couldn't we just take that land and use it the way we want to? Well, I'm not, I mean, first I'll clarify, I'm not a, I'm not a um, land attorney, um, though I've spent plenty of time talking to and working with our, with our um, county and Met Council um, property attorneys. Railroads have, in fact, their own eminent domain authority. And so going back into the 1800s, railroads like governments were given the ability to utilize eminent domain and to purchase for public purpose projects or property. And that's what built a lot of the railroads across the country. Those rules and laws have stayed in effect. And simply as I understand it, previous efforts by government entities to prove public purchase to, to, to prove public benefit, to utilize and to acquire property via eminent domain from railroads like, especially class one railroads like BNSF, Canadian Pacific, um, Union Pacific, um, those larger railroads has been unsuccessful. And so challenged in court, the likelihood that it would succeed is very small. Because believe me, we've asked that, we've asked that question as we research all of the ways on the ability to utilize the BNSF right away. We've said, what about that? And our answers become that will not be successful. 
Okay. Um, the next question is uh, about potential impacts to private property along County Road 81. And just, um, you know, what would those, what might that look like? Uh, the person mentioned that they'd already lost property due to the Botno Boulevard uh, reconstruction project. Yeah, yeah, as we're evaluating 81 and, and the alignment along there, we are we are looking at every way possible that we stay within public right away. So staying within that road right away. So we we limit the possibility of, of impacts to you know, especially private residents, but but even businesses, you know, we wanna we wanna limit those impacts along there as we're evaluating. So we're we're taking that initial run through there, you know, and as as we're doing that initial look at it you know there's still a lot of engineering work and a lot of discussion that needs to happen but uh you know right right now at least in, in, through the robinsdale area we do not see a lot of impacts to private property at least and and we 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 are feeling we can contain this pretty much to to public right away to to the road right away um okay um i'll, I'll just add to um you know i think we'll be planning a future listening session and bringing out some of that detail of what, how it could all uh, work and flow into Robbinsdale would be, can be part of that. So I'm gonna combine a couple of questions into one on this one, cause it's more of a general theme and I've definitely heard it as we've been talking to the community and getting feedback into different posts. Um, but people are wondering like, is 81, County Road 81 the only option? Can we do it? Uh, uh, someone asked about using 100, are there other options that we could look at? Um, it, it, or like, could we even, uh, Dan, you sort of address this, but looking to the old, going into the railway corridor, the BNSF corridor, is there anything we can do that wouldn't put this right down 81? So there's a couple, there's a couple things. First of all, there's a question up here. Um, Jason, that there might have been some confusion about yeah. we are not building, we are not proposing being in the railroad corridor anywhere. So if there was confusion up, like say up by Bass Lake Road, there we are also proposing, we're proposing to be on 81 from the Robbinsdale border all the way to when we transition over to West Broadway in Brooklyn Park. So even though we're very close to the railroad right away, we're closer to the railroad right away on 81 by Bass Lake Road than we are in downtown Robbinsdale. We're not on railroad property up there. So yeah. we would be on Highway 81 in the city of Crystal as well. So I think there's a, it says since you're running tracks following the original plan at Bass yeah. Lake Road, that's not quite true. We're also on 81. So are there other routes but besides 81? So when we when we first looked at making this transition we developed a list of project principles that helped guide us um in that first tier in that first cut about where to potentially build this we wanted to try to stay as true to the original alignment as possible we wanted to try to serve key destinations we wanted to try to, to enhance and further facilitate additional um, other transit investments in the area. And we did have the possibility of going, staying on 81, and instead of turning up the BNSF right away, going to 100, going up along Highway 100 and over to, and coming into downtown Robbinsdale that way, maybe along 42nd or some way that way and coming up um, and then going over to 81 in the city of Crystal. What we determined in that first cut is number one, it's way longer than was originally proposed. It misses a number of key destinations. It really doesn't serve North Minneapolis at all. It doesn't serve the North Memorial Hospital area. It's very far away from the original alignment. And frankly, doesn't really, while it, while it avoids a lot of impacts, it also avoids a lot of potential ridership as well. And so it's kind of like that really didn't make the cut in terms of a recommended alternative to move forward. So is 81 the only spot? Well, we certainly talked with City of Crystal staff, I'm sorry, City of Robbinsdale staff, 
what about West Broadway? No, West Broadway is even tighter, right through the downtown, really doesn't meet the character. We didn't really look at, you know, ranging to the, say the east side of the lakes and coming up Victory Memorial Boulevard. That, of course, didn't get into downtown Robbinsdale as well. So it's not that we wanted to narrow it down to only 81, but what we see in this quarter as key destinations are downtown Robbinsdale, North Memorial Hospital. And so trying to find a route option that serves those two general areas, doesn't use railroad right away, and stays true to the original alignment really led us to, can we make LRT work in some manner along Highway 81? So that's what got us there on the first tier cut. Now we evaluate, does it work? Will it work? How can we make it work? Thank you. Uh, and I just want to say, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited that we've got all these Robbinsdale focused questions. It's great to have the community together to ask all these things and get answers from the, the project team. So thanks for the questions and for everyone that's attending and thanks to the project team for, for, um, for your responses. Um, so the next question is around, or, or just the next comment is around um, noise. And um, there's a lot going on around 81 with the hospital being closed for people that live close to County Road 81. There's a lot of sirens from ambulances, police, more traffic since the high V's been built there. And so uh, there's concern that a light rail track being on 81 will bring more noise is are there any considerations for how much noise will be created and also if it's going to be a lot more would there be anything around um noise abatement for properties nearby yeah yeah as part of the as part of our environmental work we we do do a uh we do uh, uh, noise studies and, and, and evaluate noise impacts um, going along the, the, the corridor. So, you know, if there was adverse impacts, then, then there would need to be mitigation for it. But, you know, typically in, a, in, a, in, in some place like an existing roadway, the trains are pretty quiet and they usually are running under that, that ambient noise being the traffic, the ambulances, the sirens and stuff. The trains are usually quieter than that. You know, it's it's if we were in a in a location that that didn't have a lot of traffic, then you know we would be above it. But in, in a case like eighty one, the, the trains are typically gonna the, the sound is gonna be below the ambient noise out there. But Judy, Judy, that's a really good that's a really good yeah. question because that is the whole premise behind what is a new revised environmental impact work that yeah. goes along with a different alignment. So the environmental impact work we did for the previous alignment, built some noise barriers in some spot, built some screening in some spots, built a lot of different mitigation measures in place. And so we would do those same analyses on a different alignment to talk about what are those mitigation measures that would be put in place yeah. in order to deal with that. Noise being one, visual, um, visual impacts being one, um, air quality being, you know, all of those kind of environmental impacts, stormwater issues, any of those things become studied as part of the environmental documentation. Yeah. So uh, the next question is sort of along the same lines, just talking about, you know, emergency services on 81, sirens and police and ambulances with North Memorial. Um, are, is there any information or do you have any insight into the impact of timely responses by emergency system, uh, services located adjacent to Botno Boulevard, or County Road 81? Sure, sure, Jason. This one is, this one is, is fairly, fairly straightforward because light rail operating in a street is a lot different than freight traffic, right? In the order of preemption authority, freight railroads have priority. So if a freight railroad, a freight track, a freight train is going across um, County Road 40 or 42nd or County Road 9 um, there in Robbinsdale and the gates are down, an emergency vehicle comes, it waits because the freight train has priority. In the case of light rail that is running, in the case of light rail that is running 
um, with traffic signals and light traffic, emergency vehicle preemption still governs over light rail movement. So if a if a if a ambulance is coming down 42nd and has or, or Robbinsdale PD and has emergency vehicle preemption on that would stop the traffic on County Road 81, it would stop the light rail vehicle at County Road 81 as well. So the emergency vehicle preemption is of a higher priority than light rail doesn't have preemption authority over traffic signals and such. And so in that particular case, I mean, we've got fire stations along University Avenue that have driveways that come right out that stop light rail trains so the fire trucks can pull out of the fire stations. Um, we've got emergency vehicle preemption on all the traffic signals that that operate accordingly. Great. I learned something. That was good. <laughs> um, so next up is around um, concern about the train running along the lake and possible uh, negative impact to the lake and the residential environment. And then kind of the second part of that is that there's um, this resident is hearing some maybe residents that aren't in support are, what are we doing as far as getting the word or feedback from our community? Some of that are conversations like this, but maybe talk about some of the other ways that we're pulling to make sure every voice is heard. So it's kind of a two part. Sure. <laughs> Sophia, why don't you take the, uh, and Sam talk a little bit about the second piece, first of all, which is, you know, how we're trying to get as many and, and thankfully we've got some great partners in, in Jason and Jean that are helping us with this to get as many opinions, comments, thoughts as possible. Yeah, I would say, you know, our goal is to continue to talk to everybody and, you know, it, it's it's not just one conversation, right? It's, it, it's multiple with uh, different pieces of information over time as we develop the project. And, and so, you know, the subscribing to our newsletter to hear about all the updates that we have coming out throughout the duration of the project will always have a way for people to give input on the new pieces of information. So one of the ways is just in, for yourself and your neighbor to just get connected with us and stay connected with us. So sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Facebook or on Twitter, whatever kind of your gig is. Whenever we have uh, things to, to talk about, we will make sure you know. So uh, put pushing those things out through our social media. Um, when we have big releases of information, trying to get word out through our media. And then, you know, it is events like this, right? It is getting and talking to people uh, in venues like this, uh, going to community events in the summer. We, you know, we want to we get out of this kind of we do pop-up events, you know, so maybe going and hanging out in front of High V or at our transit stations and, and talking to people. At um, we usually will do we'll do a quarter mailing at one point in the year, so yeah. everybody kind of close to the development of light rail kind of gets that notification. And so, kind of two principles: we're always trying to push out information and talk to people as much as possible, and we're always available to connect. So whether that's reaching out directly to us or at looking for the various ways that we try to push out content, um, you know, we'll, we'll be there. And, and kind of to the part about polling as well, some of it is really individual conversations. And so there's big regional questions about light rail, but often when there's particular issues, getting together in a, in a smaller group with those affected residents often is a great way for us to find solutions. So, you know, in the extent that we, we wanna get together with your neighbors and really talk about it, whether it's an intersection or a part uh, part by the park is all as all things that we do want to do and kind of kind of to the I think this kind of feeds into the next part of the the question which is you know uh, about impacts and even impacts to park use that's something that's all part of our environmental process and it has you know also very specific times to comment and engage um, and, and 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 learn more about all, all of that I don't know if Sam would add to that yeah, Sophia, I, I would just add to, I think, um, maybe what a lot of folks are also curious is like, what are other folks talking about this project? Like, what are your neighbors talking about and how are they talking about it? So our commitment to you is to also be sharing that whatever we're hearing, we want to be able to bring out 
and share with you what we're hearing. Um, you know, Dan, myself, and Nick um, were at a city council work session last night where we were sharing a little bit of that. Our commitment is to, um, whether it's venues through this or our electronic means, or when we come out and meet with you and talk with you, is that um, we want you to know what we know as well as what we're hearing, because that just deepens our conversation. And as Sophia says, deepens our understanding on how um, folks are viewing the project or if they still have some outstanding questions or they just want to go a little bit more into some of our technical work we're happy to do that so i would just off also offer up that that's a that's a commitment we want to make to you as well so before we move on um how somebody did ask just as a follow-up how do they sign up for the newsletter is there like a specific place to go or an email or Yep, and I'll put it in chat uh, as well. But if you go to bluelineext.org, uh, just our main project website, the newsletter subscription is like front page, just right there uh, to, to sign up. And I'll put that link in chat. Thanks. So next up is just around uh, North Memorial. Um, do it sounds like there may be some ideas around putting a station near north memorial and uh if that's the case will there be new parking facilities or will there will parking be a part of that station um and would it be do you think it will be east or west of the parkway or i guess north or south <laughs> good good question um we do we do anticipate um that that if we were to fo follow this route, that we would have a station um, around North Memorial Hospital in some location. We've begun with the city, some discussions with the hospital campus, um, with some of their folks about, about how that might work, where it would go, what it would impact in terms of their service. Um, so yes, um, all the details not worked out, but we would anticipate something along that line. Parking's a good one. Parking's one we talked a little bit about with the council last night. The previous alignment, when we were on BNSF right away, anticipated a park and ride structure being constructed right in and around where the EMI building is, the old Robbinsdale Farm and Garden, right there on the corner of 42nd and BNSF um, over there um, next to the railroad tracks. We haven't really went back and done a full analysis of, do we need parking everywhere, nowhere? Where would we put park and rides? Would we combine it with some kind of a municipal parking uh, piece in downtown Robbinsdale? Would we have parking by the hospital, by downtown, by both, by neither? A um, little early for that, but it's certainly something we, a little early for us to know exactly the answer, but certainly something we're working on kind of how the project comes together and where that would make sense. All right. Um, and I guess kind of connected to that, the next question makes sense. Um, do you have more information on where you think, I know we kind of mentioned generally between 40th and 42nd, but do you have a sense of where that downtown Robbinsdale station might be? I, I, that's probably as close as we are right now, you know, okay. evaluating how we'll run through there and, and what the impacts are and how the intersections operate and, and, and really with, you know, development that's there and, and plan development that, that that'll really key into how we locate a station to there. Okay. okay. Um, so the next question is just around um, the expansion of light rail in general, uh, you know, with COVID and everything that's gone on um public transit uh use is down I, I i think that sounds accurate um but do you think that over the long term that that will change or i mean is this what do the forecasts look like as far as public transit and light rail making sense for our community i, I would say that the first thing that actually light rail feeds into what we're seeing about ridership patterns is that need for your non-traditional nine to five commute so even during the pandemic, seeing how people are shifting their uses, like, um, and we'll see how this plays out exactly with uh, with the office, but Metro Transit scene, you know, we used to have these huge peaks and valleys at our AM and PM rush. And, you know, kind of through the pandemic, it, people didn't stop riding, 
it just the ridership was down. And, and even as people are starting to get vaccinated and we're seeing a little bit more, some people return to riding transit uh, than we have in the last year, serving that non-traditional peak usage, I think will really play into the future of our ridership. So this fast frequent Metro network that is available throughout the day, um, I think will is, is, is really gonna tap into some of our need for future, for future ridership and future ridership needs. Like, um, I, I think a lot of us can anticipate we might go into the office, but only for part of the day or for a specific meeting. And so having a transit service where you can do that uh, and rely on it, you know, to get, you know, maybe you're going to downtown and you want to get right back home. Uh, and also too, you know, this is a, a light rail investment is something that's meant for, you know, generations. And, you know, in, in, our, in our system, sometimes we see blips and the pandemic was definitely one of them. But overall, you know, we are seeing a new a generation of folks that uh, care about climate change, that care about a transit oriented lifestyle uh, and looking for a metro region that provides um, those facilities are, is trends in ridership that we continue to see. Yeah, and Sophia, I would add just simply from a county board standpoint, county board just recently last week or the week before adopted a new climate action plan. Um, the county is, the county commissioners are committed to wanting to provide options for people to be able to move around that are not just simply driving. And so the world is is gonna change. Um, I'm sitting in my office and I'm sitting in my kitchen. They're the same spot right now and have been for a long time. I'm hoping they will not continue to be for the rest of my career, the same spot. But at the same time, Sophia's right, work patterns have changed. And so we don't know that there will be continue to be a AM and PM peak hour um, where people are driving and uh, act, but that it'll be more spread out during the day. And so um, again, we still see the continued build out of the network that the Twin Cities has put in place for light rail to be something that both the Met Council and the County Board feel are important. And Dan, if I could maybe just add to that, I think it's something to be very proud of from this region where um, some of our sister pro um, agencies across the country where they saw like about 75% reduction in their ridership. And a lot of that was just because we couldn't be gathering in places. So that meant buses, that meant trains. It's not that the demand went away, it's just that the protocols were demanding that. And even though we saw um, across the nation about a 75% average reduction in ridership, the Twin Cities held their own at like 53%. So there was still a strong need. Um, we were still able to provide some good service even during the pandemic. And um, we're happy to say that we're beginning to recover from that. Um, we've been slowly adding additional services to um, meet that demand. So I get the question. I understand that yes, ridership is down, Right now, we do not anticipate that to be a permanent thing. And I think a little bit about, yes, there will be some behavior changes. I think that's a good observation. Um, there are companies that are thinking of coming back out into communities a little bit more, maybe not being so concentrated into downtown. That serves light rail well, right? Like if the communities um, that are um, that companies are moving to also have light rail service, that's great. That just provides you an opportunity to go from Robbinsdale to Brooklyn Park or go into Minneapolis or go into Crystal and vice versa. So it just makes the system actually more efficient um, if those patterns do continue. So it's a great question. And I think um, we'll can, we continue to monitor, monitor that and, and happy to share um, when we're seeing some different trends as well. So the next question is um, around, you know, mitigation uh, for or, or getting around disruption to emergency vehicles and local traffic. Has there been any consideration to elevating the rail lines or maybe, um, I know I've heard some questions around tunnels or, or almost like a subway as well. Nathan, um, I want to maybe talk about our process of kind of where we start and how we use structure to find out when we need solutions. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I, I I probably should have touched. I, I was supposed to touch a little bit on this on my on my previous presentation. But you know, when, when we first look at, at at a light rail alignment, uh, we look at, at at convenience and operation and, and make sure that it's the best and 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 as operationally and for convenience of of the um, uh, of the customers that are going to be using light rail. Really, at grade light rail is is our best option. It's easy to you know cross the street. Get on the platform, get on the train, get off the train, you know, cross the street and get up. You're not going up and down stairs or if, if you have uh, mobility issues, you're not trying to, you know, get to an elevator or and in this climate, you know, outdoors escalators really don't work. So, you know, then you end up with stair structures. So, so either going up or down really becomes problematic for users. It becomes a little bit more of an inconvenience. But, you know, everything is on the table right now as we're evaluating it. You know, we'll, we'll look at at grade the and and make sure that that works and if we run into issues you know if it's not compatible with traffic as we're doing the evaluation or we run into space limitations or or grade limitations i mean if we got across highway 100 we're, we're going to be on a structure so at that point we'd look at structures which would be either bridges or you know going below grade as it is but uh, th i will say yeah, go ahead, Jan. I was, I was going to say, I will say, Jason, the one thing we have kind of taken off the table, if you will, through Robbinsdale, through Robbinsdale anyway, is the likelihood of building some kind of a tunnel structure. The water table uh, issue, you know, the, the proximity to Crystal Lake, some of those things would make trying to bury it, trying to put it underground a little more difficult. Um, but the council even last night asked us, to look at what a rendering might be or what a what a visualization might be to have an elevated piece through downtown or maybe even through more than, than downtown. And we can look at that. I think there's pros and cons of being in the air as well. Um, so especially as it gets to stations, right? LRT tracks up in the air are not, not as big a deal. An LRT station up in the air might be might be a little diff more difficult for people to get to and from. So where do the stations go? How does it all fit? Which intersections do we cross? All of those kind of things. It is open and on the table as a possible alternative through um, through this area. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so the next question kind of goes back to the idea of light rail in general and just new modes of transportation and people remote working, but um, kind of asking about, would it make sense to um, use a, an enhanced bus system for transit uh, to serve the needs of Robbinsdale as opposed to using light rail? So, you know, I, as, we, as we look at the region, um, there's many ways for us to serve a lot of our customers. A lot of our transit riders definitely have different needs. So for some folks, definitely buses kind of work a little bit better if they have kind of that uh, shorter trip or if they're commuters from like one end to the other, um, that might uh, it be a solution for them. Um, given the past work and given that the work that we've done um, on this project, we know that light rail makes sense. We will need to definitely update some of our ridership numbers and especially as we look at Robbinsdale, um, like what two stations now could potentially generate in terms of that. So we'll have an understand for demand and usage um, for light rail. And um, I would also just say that um, very true, like the existing blue line and the existing green line and Southwest LRT will do this when it gets a little bit closer to opening day is that we take a look at the existing system and making sure that we're complementing and that buses and trains are working together and complement each other and really kind of make those connections a little bit easier and faster. So not only are you going kind of north south, but you're able to also go east west in our communities. So um, so the buses definitely have a role and it's um, a piece that is part of our, our transit network. But I think for right now, for what we're doing, it's, uh, it's light rail. The numbers have um, um, shown us that we can support light rail service and we'll have more information as we get into a little bit more of the details here and that we can bring that out and share that for sure. 
I mean, some of the other things, Jason, that I might add here, and this is really for for this question. This is a this is a really this is a really good a really good question, and one that one that as transportation um, professionals that we are, engineers and planners that work work on this all the time, is one we struggle with because light rail cannot go everywhere, right? Light rail is a very is a very expensive a very expensive public improvement and it needs to be able to go where actually demand and ridership justify the investment. At the same time, it's been proven in many cases that light rail also serves as a way to help put into communities the kind of economic development and um, community development changes that can come along with it to make those places um, more robust and and um, and change their character. And so to that end, um, it becomes a hard decision where to and not to put LRT. And I can tell you that one of the things that our, that our county commissioners would say is that the Northwest section of Hennepin County deserves the level of investment equal to other areas of Hennepin County so while there's a light rail down Hiawatha into Bloomington and while there's a light rail line down into the Southwest communities that the Northwest corridor, if you will, of Hennepin County deserves the level of investment and the level of improvement and community benefits that can come along with light rail. So to the extent that it can still be justified, our policy makers still want to move forward with the attempt to implement a light rail line in this section of Hennepin County, which many will say has not received the level of investment um, in transportation infrastructure as other parts of Hennepin County or other parts of the Metro. And so why not us? Why why can't we get an improvement like this as well? So that's part of where some of that thinking comes to be. I think one of the things too to think about is magnitude on these when people bring up buses, BRT or whatever, and, and passengers. Uh, you know, our previous project as we did the numbers, we were looking at serving 26,000 passengers a day. And, and so you start putting, you know, looking at the numbers there, you know, BRT is, is very effective where, where it serves, but, uh, you know, a BRT bus, an articulated bus is about 60 passengers on it, uh, where uh, a, a train car that, you know, we, we would run three car concepts. So we, there's three con three concepts per train going through during, you know, the peak hours of the day, and that can carry 270 people. And, you know, we run on typically 10 minute headways. So you can haul a lot of people through on the train and on that system where that would take a lot, a lot of buses, you know, it, it would start clogging up the ends with buses to, to, to make yeah. that same uh, commitment. So this next one is really just more feedback than a question, but it just says that uh, they're excited to see the new route options and even more excited to see that there might be two stations in Robbinsdale. So uh, thanks to the project team for all your work which is nice to hear. Um, so the next question is around just um, thinking ahead to driverless vehicles and personal rapid transit. Will light rail be something that people use into the future? So if we have self-driving cars, will we still need light rail? I guess, has that been given any thought? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say, you know, Metro Transit here is a lot of, in variations of this question, right? Like, well. Will people even ride? Will people ride buses? Will you know buses be driverless? How all of this works? And you know the 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 future is out there, and we can we can guess about what it looks like. Um, but you know one of the things that a metro network provides is that is that spine um, for people to get around, and even with driverless cars, um, you still have roadway capacity. You think about a, a growing region. And so a metro network uh, gives you that ability, you, you know, if we're all sharing drive, uh, driverless cars, right, maybe you, you get it from your home to a light rail station, and then you walk the last block to your work. And so thinking about how that all kind of complements each other and how the future could really make, you know, it, it's, it's, we're trying to make a future that's easier, right? And so how, how all of that could look and, and kind of work together um, but I think, you know, when we think of how people need to move through our region, and again, to some of our climate action goals, 
getting people out of personal vehicles and into these in, into options that you still travel fast and safely and uh, with nice amenities is is part of our future. So if, if I could just maybe add to that about the driverless cars, driverless cars are still only going to go as fast as traffic is going to allow you. So if there are winter conditions, if there's things that are, you know, an accident, unfortunately, that pogs up, that's sort of the beauty and the reliability of light rail is that if it takes 15 minutes to get to your destination today, it's going to take 15 minutes tomorrow, regardless of um, kind of the weather or anything like that. So um, not to say that there isn't probably enough movement to um, make driverless cars. And I think somebody even said personal rapid transit. Um, right now, the region doesn't have any plans for personal rapid transit. All of that, and there's going to be some new technologies that we don't know. I mean, I'm still waiting for my hoverboard, right? I thought we were promised some hoverboards or something, and that still hasn't happened quite yet. Um, but Sophia is right. I think part of this is that we are linking into a larger network. Folks are still going to go to the airport. Folks are still going to go to the Mall of America. They're still downtown. St. Paul is a destination. Downtown Minneapolis will continue to be destination. So this has that fast, reliable component that a lot of folks are, are, are looking for. There's still Willettes and Pig Ate My Pizza and all these places in Robbinsdale that are just gems of the region as well that you would travel to to eat at. That's where we <laughs> went at. So, yeah, exactly. It's true. I'd, I'd heard of driverless cars, but I haven't, I'm not familiar with personal rapid transit. I'm going to have to look into that. Um, next question is just around accessibility. So for people with limited mobility or in a wheelchair or, you know, need assistance in other ways, is that something that the project team is taking into account in Robbinsdale? Uh, de definitely. As, as we're designing light rail, our stations, our access to the stations, that's that's really primary is making sure that they're accessible, safe, and and easy to get to. Uh, at Metro Transit, we have a trans a, a, a transit accessibility advisory committee that we meet with all the time. Uh, those are people with with all different abilities that that we we go through and and talk about our design. We go out there and look at existing designs and and look at the the good things and things that we need to improve on with that. Um, and so that that really is key: the safety of getting people. You know, to the stations and and on the stations is is a is a thing we spend a lot of time on, and we and we do have workshops and 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 everything on that is going through our design uh, with with folks of of all abilities. So, um, the next question is really around. I think Nick, this is for you. Just around what is the required width of uh for tracks to run down eighty. I guess along with that, um, would this be cutting back on the number of lanes or like turn lanes? I know I've heard people ask about, will this change the number of lanes on 81 through Robbinsdale? Um, I, I guess as, as our initial run through, so for the first question is, what is what is our, our typical guideway width? It's 28 to, to 30 feet where we're not at a station area. Stations, you know, depending on how that is, is set up are, are wider to, to get that platform in there. Um, so that that's the width of that. As far as our initial run through, taking a look at how it affects you know traffic on 81, we, we believe that we can keep four lanes of traffic or four lanes of traffic, two lanes in each direction as is out there today. Um, most of the intersections, I think we keep full uh, capacity, meaning you know you know at least the left turn lanes going through there, the the full movements, you know the the east west north south movements on those intersections. So. But you know the, the things that we'll need to look at and refine is you know for instance uh, 42 there's there's double lefts that that go uh, northbound to up on 42 to to westbound and, and we'll have to take a look at you know is that necessary and how do we get those to to, to fit so the, the the answer the the short answer is yes we will try to keep the same functionality that's out there so we do not have significant adverse effects to intersections or the capacity of the road out there so so uh next up is just around um questions around crime uh around light rail stations and are are there any plans of mitigation uh, um to keep our neighborhoods safe uh and i guess along with that would would robinsdale police be involved in in that or is that something separate 
We can answer we can answer that one for sure. And first to start out with, it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that uh, light rail increases police crime. Um, the you know our stations are not in uh, awesome places to do crime, right? There's a lot of lighting. There's you're on camera. They're patrolled by our Metro Transit police. Uh, but that's not to say that Metro Transit needs to continue to focus on safety and work with the community on safety. You know, our stations in, are a gathering place in a community and often um, reflect what's what's going on. Um, so if there's if there's you know uh, if there's things that need to be addressed in community already in terms of safety, that will that's something that we also know we have to address uh, at our stations. But in terms of you know people coming to a location just to steal stuff on light rail, um, it's not a great it's not a great you know thing to do because it, once you get on your on the train, you're stuck and you get caught, right? So um, uh, it just because a station's there, just because uh, uh, transit exists, doesn't mean that we see an increase in crime. Uh, we do, however, know that we that uh, our riders uh, prioritize safety. And it's an it's an ongoing conversation from simple things like street harassment um, to, you know, just people walking home uh, and whatnot. And and so as, as part of, as we develop this project, we, Metro Transit specifically hires Metro Transit Police to, police, uh, to patrol our light rail system and kind of keep it, keep an eye on things. Um, some folks might be following about just kind of right now, our Metro Transit Police Department uh, kind of checks tickets and things like that. There might be some changes on that front. Um, but overall, you know, we kind of look at a holistic approach to to keeping our system as something that, that feels like a comfortable place to be. Um, and Metro Transit keeps, it continues to try to advance ways uh, for people to report issues like our text for safety initiative where you, you know, you're on the train you see something little you want to report it uh, metro transit tracks where we hear complaints and have issues and puts additional resources uh, in those areas sophia i'd also add that uh, metro transit also has and maintains what's called a fire life safety committee and so that committee would then bring in new entities, um, guys, that are like, in this case, Robbinsdale Fire and Police, right? Because it is different. You've got a different situation when you've got a light rail line in the community. So I know from my work on Central Porter that Minneapolis was very familiar with light rail, but for the city of St. Paul, as we built light rail on University Avenue and into downtown, um, St. Paul, that that was new for their fire and PD. So how does the two police departments work together? How does fire um, respond to, uh, to emergencies that take place? Those kind of things to help bring those community departments. So city of Crystal, city of Robbinsdale, city of Brooklyn Park, that would all potentially be new owners of light rail systems in their, in their city would work with those, um, those Either police or fire to help uh, to help see what that is all how that all works together. Yeah, and it's a good point. The fire life safety committee. I I, I sit down in those uh, those committee and those meetings uh, often or regularly, and and they are they are integral to the design of the project going through it. So uh, you know our, our design and everything gets presented to that committee. But in addition to that, as we're going through to design the fire life and safety committee, we have uh, uh, we have workshops. With, with with that committee and and the and the the local first responders to, to in each city. So, you know, in, in the previous design, we did meet with 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 the with the police and fire and and and, and first responders throughout uh, throughout the network. Robbinsdale was was in there too, and, and we talked about specific area stations and and rail crossings and intersections and stuff and and how those would be handled and 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 so we we have had those discussions. That coordination, they are involved in on, on the design up front and then throughout the system as it's operating. And Nick, maybe just even um, as we develop some of our stations over time, and we did this uh, for Southwest, is that we brought the community involved and we take a look at those station designs, right? And we talked about sight lines, like as you get off the vehicle, where, where are you looking? Where are you going? What signage are you looking for to also help you 
orientate if you are visiting feel like somebody's coming to robinsdale and they're coming to a great restaurant or they're going to go hang out at wickard ward so it's also um intuitive in terms of where your destinations could be and we work with the community to help us with that as well great so we have a few minutes left. There's two questions. Well, we just got another question. So uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to run over by much, but if we need to, I was going to go with the last two questions that I had. One is a little more of a conversation. So I was going to save that for last, but um, I guess let's just go with, do you anticipate expansion onto frontage roads to meet the required width needs that we talked about earlier? I, I guess it, that as we're, as we're looking at designs and stuff, there there could be impacts of the frontage roads, uh, uh, but but we're, we're not that far into design yet to determine what those exactly would be. I don't see frontage roads. Uh, well, I, I guess like you know, for instance, along the lake there, uh, we 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 can stay away from those. But you know, some of those may uh, be reconfigured. Uh, but we're we're really early. I mean, we yeah. might we might touch them, but. We wouldn't take away access. We we would we would work to maintain access to properties throughout. So then the next question is with light rail proposed through North Minneapolis, how is the light rail project working in conjunction with uh, economic development for North Minneapolis and Robbinsdale? So let me give you a, a quick you know, a bit of a quick background on on that, Jason. So Sam and Nick and myself as as hennepin county and metro transit transportation folks are working through the process to implement a light rail line and so therefore addressing the engineering and impacts of that transportation investment parallel to that going on hennepin county community works also has in place uh Blue Line Extension Community Works Steering Committee that is also made up of various representatives from the municipalities and Met Council to work on what we sometimes call beyond the rail type efforts, which really have a lot to do with how do land use plans and potential for economic development play hand in hand with the implementation of an infra infrastructure project like this, because obviously that's a key thing. And all you have to do to see what that means is to drive down University Avenue. And if you saw what University Avenue looked like before the light rail line was built and to how it's starting to, to change um, and, and, and create some different opportunities, that they're happening. And, and some of that economic development is happening. So specific to Robbinsdale, we certainly, there's some certainly some wonderfully new things that are there, right? IV, uh, some of the new residential developments, either open or soon to be open, down near 36th are underway. Those will be in place. Are there other spots in Robbinsdale that are likely to have this potential light rail project be the impetus and the catalyst for some redevelopment there. So we'll continue to work with the cities and their planning departments where the land use authority lies um, within that, but also to gather up as a larger community. And so our community, our um, Hennepin County Community Work staff, along with Metro Transit TOD staff and local planning staff, as well as local communities are parallel working on very similar um, issues around that. We're happy to bring some of that both, and, and I should say, both in Robbinsdale, Mo North Minneapolis, Crystal, Brooklyn Park, all the communities along the line. We're happy to bring some of that to a future um, town hall, listening session, whatever it may be, if people want to engage in some of those topics as well. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, before I know, you know, if anyone was planning to leave right at eight, I want to let you know that we're going to have another listening session for Robbinsdale, uh, at the beginning of June. So that's going to be on June 9th, another Wednesday night. We'll do the same timing from 6:30 to 8 PM. So, um, hopefully you found this beneficial and useful and you can join us in our next meeting. Cause I think there's going to be more details and more information to share at that point. Um, 
the one other thing that uh, there are a couple of other questions here to bring up. Um, one just says, um, well, it's asking about just Metro Transit and utilizing Metro Transit as uh, an extension of, over, of overnight homeless shelters. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's the case, but it says that downtown shelters give homeless rail tickets to address overflow. Do we? So, yes, yeah, so I could. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, okay, thanks. You know, the the use of um, metro transit trains by our unsheltered community obviously has been in the news in the past. And just a, just a couple things with that is that I think all all of our partners that are working on providing services to the unsheltered. Uh, including Metro Transit, recognize that our trains are not a suitable alternative to adequate shelter. Um, you know, there's no bathrooms, there's no, there's no water. Um, it's, it's not a place that, that is, it's not a service alternative. Uh, obviously, people sometimes use it uh, as, as an option, uh, but we have been taking very proactive measures to, to work with the people that use our facilities. Uh, to, to find options. So Metro Transit has our homeless action team hat um, that actively goes onto our trains uh, basically nightly and, and, and uh, talks to anybody that it might be needing, in need of shelter to see if they can find them uh, overnight facilities and not the other way around. Um, so, you know, it is, it is uh, some people choose our services, but we also don't operate over uh, fully overnight. Um, so it is not an alternative to be off the streets fully all night and, and have a good place to sleep. Um, I personally have done outreach to our unsheltered on our trains um, as an effort to develop Metro Transit's program and find solutions. And there, while it sometimes gets a bad rap and there's definitely a lot of attention that Metro Transit needs to get to it, there's a lot of people that are just seeking service and we are committed to um, addressing that need within our region. And I know Hennepin County has also had very proactive measures over the last year uh, to build our shelter capacity in our region, which is very much needed. It, that discussion, those discussions between Hennepin County, Ramsey County and Metro Transit around, um, around unsheltered homeless folks is and continues to go on. So very important topic. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, so I think we're at the end of our time here. Uh, I wanna thank our project team and also the residents of Robbinsdale and everyone else that joined this call. I know I was asking the questions, but those were being fed by our community. So I know it was like I was getting responded to, but I was just asking the questions on this call uh, and this conversation for everybody else from our community. So thank you to everyone who joined. And again, um, we're gonna meet and have more conversation on June 9th uh, from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then also it sounds like Commissioner Lundy is having a Facebook Live uh, of that. So maybe you look that up as well and we'll, um, we'll, we'll be talking soon. <laughs> I will say, Jason and Gene, you guys do a very good job of getting a good crowd together. Excellent. <laughs> The more people, you know, for us, the more people, the better, because then we're able to hear and really network with with folks out in the community. And that's always great. Yeah, we just want to end with a huge thank you to, to both of you for all of your uh, civic engagement efforts. And we we really, really appreciate it. And uh, I hope your community also recognizes your, your good work. <laughs> we thank you very, very much. Yeah. Okay, everybody, have a good night. All right, thanks, Thank everyone. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank you.